Oh my gosh, this is exciting. So first, I'd like to thank Juan Paolo and Andrea for having us all together. This is amazing. I've met so many amazing interaction designers and just people doing incredible things, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, next, I'd like to ask the audience. Um, I know that Netflix has been around in Latin America since 2011, but how many of you guys have Netflix accounts? Okay, everyone. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. So um, in the following slides, there are going to be just a little bit of spoilers. I'm sorry if you're not totally caught up on Stranger Things or Jessica Jones or Daredevil. But really, Jessica Jones and Daredevil, you've had like a year, so get it, get it together here. Okay. So, um, oh, where's my clicker? <laughs> Don't know how to change the slide. Sorry, one second. So I want to begin today by introducing you to some of my favorite Netflix characters, ones that have truly inspired me. Matt Murdock's life was never going to be easy. He grew up with a struggling father who wanted more from Matt than life had given him. Raised in gritty New York City, Matt sees problems everywhere. And, be, and, people are, and despite having been blinded as a young boy, he doesn't run away from his problems or the problems of the city he loves. He decides to fight for himself and his city against the evil crime syndicates that threaten to rule. Dustin, Mike, and Lucas are three 12-year-old boys whose best friend has vanished after leaving them to ride his bike home. Do you remember what it was like being 12? I don't know about you, but if my best friend went missing in the middle of the night, I would have hidden under my parents' bed for months. Not these boys. They go searching for him in the pouring rain. And even after they suspect that something much more sinister is going on, they continue their search. And last, Jessica Jones. Do you know what I love about this description? Jessica Jones uses her gifts as a private eye to find her tormentor before he can harm anyone else. Someone at Netflix wrote this for our display page as the caption for Jessica Jones, and I think it's hilarious. Do you know why? Because Jessica Jones's predominant trait is superhuman strength. But this lovely writer chose to point out her normal human skills of being a stellar private eye. To me, though, Jessica Jones isn't special for either of these things. She's special because her arch nemesis controls minds. She manages to free herself from him once, and rather than run off to a remote island and change her name and identity, she stays and she fights. These characters aren't special because of any kind of superhuman ability. The reason they are incredible heroes is because they do not run away from their problems. They chase them. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. When I learned to chase problems I saw around me and attempted to solve them with design thinking, it completely changed the course of my design career. Now, before I tell you about that, I want to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Alex Osorio. I'm a product designer on the mobile team at Netflix. Uh, and when I ran my presentation by my design VP at Netflix, he said, Alex, you're waiting until slide 10 to introduce yourself. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I am. And you know why, Steve? Because I don't want you all to walk away today thinking about me or how great I am. That doesn't matter. What matters is the message that I want you all to leave here inspired to chase problems that you see in your community, in your world around you. So back to me just a little bit. I'm currently working on the mobile team. I have experience across platforms. And I have also worked in the kids area of Netflix. I want to share a little bit about my background with you and where I come from. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. And now some of you are like, well, then why aren't you speaking Spanish? <laughs> um, that's because I went to the US with my mom when I was three years old. Um, and we spoke, she spoke no English. We spoke no English. We had no money. Um, and we were illegal immigrants until I was about 12. We had one friend when we moved to Los Angeles. 
And I want to tell you more about this, but first I also want to introduce you all to Netflix, even though lots of you have it. Um, many of you have, have it and have an account, but bear with me while I share some of these clips. Can we lower the lights? This is exactly where I am supposed to be right now. The universe brought us together. I'm a part of a community that I love. Sometimes you know something's coming. You feel it in the air. You will enjoy the greatest adventure of all. We had no idea what we were in for. I will win, and I will leave a legacy. You mean we will? You feel joy and pleasure. That's just the beginning. You are no longer just you. I still believe the world is good. This is the true meaning of community. Lo mejor es que ganemos este puto partido! I feel like this is my new favorite show. You say that about every show. Because right now, actually, all shows are amazing. It's the golden age of television. Can we please not talk during the show? The work is not yet finished. What are you going to do? Whatever it takes. If you don't stop fighting, you could change the world. What is it that has brought this family together? Victory! Victory! How would you like to participate in the birth of something extraordinary? We got food, we got booze, we got attractive people. Remember, I'm a celebrity. <laughs> I'm saying to the world, this is how I feel. Stand up and say, we're different. We're the strong ones, and you can't break us. It's love. It's two people connecting with four other people and aliens. This clip gives me goosebumps for three reasons. The first is that when I see this clip, like Piper Chapman in Orange is the New Black, I really do feel like a part of a community. At Netflix, in the interaction design community, but also in the world at large. The world is actually a very small place if you let it be. The second is that all my life I have thought films were magical. My dad tried to start a video store in our garage and I had like 99 VHSs. It was magical. I thought it was great as a kid. Um, and when my, I got to combine the magic of cinema and design together in a career, I thought I was the luckiest person alive. And then the third reason is what's written up here. Jessica Jones says in the clip, if you don't stop fighting, you could change the world. And really, you could replace the word fighting with designing. If you don't stop designing, you could change the world. To us, it may feel like the internet is old, but in the grand scheme of things, it's so new. And we are all pioneering what it means to chase problems when you have the internet to work with. As a modern day designer, you can and should solve problems for yourself, your friends, and your community. But with more and more of the world being connected digitally, you can start solve to solve problems on a global scale. And that is truly amazing. Chasing problems seems like a pretty obvious thing to do, right? Who doesn't want to solve their own problems or the problems of their friends and communities? But it's much more difficult than it sounds. And it took me a long time to start, and even after I needed to keep pushing myself. When I graduated design school, I moved to New York City. I gave myself a month on my savings to find a job and a place to live. On day 30, I found a job. My first job was in pharmaceutical advertising. Not only was I not chasing problems, I was probably creating some. 
Uh, after two years, I began freelancing. I took on clients like Flipboard, Google Ventures project called Home, Homelight, and Subatomic Systems. And after a short stint in freelancing, I decided to take an opportunity to start full-time at Apple. In these four years, I had learned so much. And through design thinking, I was solving problems, but they were the problems others had asked me to solve. Now, I wanna walk you through five design projects, starting with the two first side projects where I really learned to chase problems, where my mentality sort of flipped and I realized that design was just a part of my passion and that if I combined that with solving real problems for myself, my friends, or my community, that it could completely change the way I worked and give my design career much more meaning. The first project I wanna walk you through is so close to my heart. A few minutes ago, I started to tell you the story of how my mother and I emigrated to the United States when I was very small. The founder of Javi is also an immigrant to the United States from Mexico. And the idea came from his childhood experience of entering the public school system, not having the same English language literacy skills as the other children. When he told me his story, it hit so close to home. You see, when we were still very new to the US, my mother took me to go see Santa Claus in the mall. We got up to the booth where she needed to fill out some paperwork so that I could have my photo taken. She stood there staring at the paperwork for a good long time. And I shook her hand and I said, Mom, what's wrong? And she looked down at me and with tears in her eyes, she said, I'm sad because I can't read this. And that memory sticks strong with me today. And it was there when I decided to work on Javi. Hispanic children entering the U.S. school system are about eight months behind. This isn't working. <laughs> are about eight months behind in literacy skills compared to their American peers. Early schooling, both preschool and kindergarten, are proven to decrease that gap significantly. However, a lot of immigrant families are afraid of what paperwork will be asked for when they register their children or don't have the time off work to go, to, go to, to their school and drop them off and pick them up. So what can designers do to help put a dent in this problem? We started with an app available on both iOS and Android that, prevent, that parents could download and give to their children to play with. We took the app into Mexican American community centers and put it into the hands of parents and children to play with. We observed their behavior and saw where we still needed to improve. We also designed a responsive website that gave parents the information they needed to download the app and to learn more about how to help their children gain the necessary literacy skills to succeed. The second project I wanna walk you through was for a friend of mine who runs her own company called The Insightful Executive. Silvana Roche is a passionate, intelligent coach who challenges me to constantly be improving. When I met her, she hadn't fully embraced design as part of her strategic business efforts and wasn't yet attracting the clientele she knew she could with the right message. So I began to work with her to define her voice. We explored a range of styles for her voice and considered both digital and print mediums when selecting the handcrafted and warm tone for her brand. From there, we built out a brand style guide that addressed everything from how her brand voice should sound in writing to how her logo should change from website to mobile app. We translated this newfound design into all of her materials, including these slides for a conference talk she gave on the five key traits of leadership. We speculated her new clients were digital natives, there it is, and had grown up with the internet. Also that they were highly aware of digital advertising and had perfected avoiding it. So we tested this warmer, more personal design among friends who fit Silvana's desired client base. And after a few weeks, we landed on a successful design. I'd like to transition now into the work we do at Netflix. I'll start by walking you through some of the problems or some of the methods we use to chase problems and really get to the core of what our users need. The first thing our team usually does is identify an opportunity. 
And we do this by making sure we're using our own product on all of our platforms all the time. I can't stress this enough. If you design a product, you must be the user as well. As a design team, we're quite lucky to be designing a product most of us were already using before we were designers at Netflix. But it's bigger than that. Not only should you be using your product, but you should also be observing it. Always be asking yourself, does this experience make sense? Could it be any better? What's missing? What can be taken away? The second point I want to make is around um, identifying an opportunity, and that is the phrase that we use most often at Netflix, it's freedom and responsibility. And what this means is that we all have the autonomy to use our expertise and insight to find a new business opportunity. At Netflix, we say a good idea can come from anywhere. And it's the truth. If you're a motivated designer with a great insight, you are free to drive your idea through to the Netflix customer experience. In the next phase, we validate the opportunity with data. Netflix loves data. Some people are, think that data and design are two opposing forces, like oil and water, they just don't merge. In my time at Netflix, I couldn't find this to be further from the truth. Data helps our design team ask the right questions at the right time, and then it helps us create a solution that has the ability not only to be aesthetically impactful, aesthetically pleasing, but also have a meaningful impact. At this stage, the data just tells us there is a there there. The translators are gonna have a fun time with that one. <laughs> it just means that at this stage, the data tells us that we're onto something. We're headed in the right direction. So once we know, oh, okay, it's just me. <laughs> so once we know we're onto something, we come up with one and sometimes a lot more than one hypothesis. There we go, hypothesis, okay. I was talking with Sue Cooper, who is the founder of, one of the founders of Cooper Design, the other night at dinner, and we were discussing the concept of little d design and big d design. And she was talking about little d design being the work we do every day in Photoshop or Sketch or Illustrator. And it's the choosing of typefaces and the implementations of brand colors, but big d design, that's where the meat's at. It's the solving of big problems. I like to think of product designers as hybrids between scientists and artists. We merge little d design with big d design. One of the best ways we at Netflix know to get to the heart of a problem is to come up with a hypothesis. And if you've never seen one before, it sounds something like, if we change A, it will affect B, giving us desired result C. After we have a hypothesis, we can test it. Let me pause here and talk about the importance of having the freedom to fail. We run unsuccessful tests at Netflix all the time. All the time. <laughs> There's the old joke that weathermen are the only people allowed to be wrong all the time and still keep their jobs, but we might give them a run for their money. Coming up with the wrong hypothesis is one of the best things that can happen to you because all of learning is a process of elimination. A failed test means we have that much more information to shape a winning test. We test our ideas in three key ways, and there I am again. <laughs> Qualitative research, which can involve man on the streets, or in homes, or through focus groups. And one of the things I found funny working as a designer at Netflix is that I have been doing qualitative research when working with Javi, the literacy app I was telling you about. I just didn't know it was called that. Uh, user research is not just for large corporations with lots of resources. You can take the initiative to gather data yourself. Will it be perfect at first? Of course not, but it's a good place to start. The second kind of research we do is quantitative, and this has more to do with gathering statistical data from a larger set of users that can maybe show us a more reliable pattern of user behavior. Don't be fooled into thinking that as a young designer, you need big data to make anything meaningful. George Murphy, who spoke at 99U this year and is a Spotify user researcher, said, you can uncover 85% of common usability issues with five people. The third method we use is A-B testing. At Netflix, we fall susceptible to designing for ourselves all the time. 
we convince ourselves that a design that would be appealing to us would also be appealing to a larger, more general audience. A-B testing proves us wrong all the time. A-B testing is a great way to drill down into a single variable and test versions of it. If you change more than one variable at a time, it will be impossible to tell which variable had the desired impact. After a failed test, our design team, along with our data and engineering teams, work together to understand why it failed and keep modifying our hypothesis and our test methods until we come up with a solution. Sometimes this can be a quick process and sometimes it can take years. Learn to find joy in the curiosity and not in the success. Even though I have written these steps in a line and it might look like a process to you, it's so much more organic than that. Sometimes you learn something by accident, which leads you to go searching for data to see if there's an opportunity. Let it happen the way it happens. Now that you're familiar with the way we chase problems at Netflix, I want to tell you the story of how we got the app icon we have today. Some of you might be thinking, an app icon? Really? Our app icon is actually the front door to our entire app experience. If our users can't find our app icon, they're never getting to the rest of our app experience. People organize their apps in all kinds of crazy ways. Is it gonna run? Some people are all about buckets. Others are all about function. Each app with the other apps of its kind. I personally organize my apps by color. One of our Netflix designers was using his iPhone one day after our app update in 2015 and noticed that he was, he was having trouble finding the Netflix app. So this is one of the best things about being a designer at Netflix and I can't stress this enough. He was using the app or he was using our experience and he noticed that he was having trouble. So he went and looked for data. You see, in June of 2014, let me back up a little bit. So in June of 2014, a user would have been looking for a red app with our white word mark on it. But in June of 2015, they had to find a white app with a red word mark on it. So he followed his instinct and went searching for data to validate his insight. After extensive user research, Netflix discovered that users were in fact having a tough time finding our app and were often confusing it with apps that were entertainment related, the color red, or associated with a camera in some way, or even a combination of all three. We learned that the apps with the fastest response times were simple to spot from a distance and oftentimes they were very bright. And with this data, we could have chosen to make a very bright app icon, right? We could have had all this information and been like, let's make the app that takes people 0 0.001 seconds to find. But that's not really what we did. It's not, it's not where we ended up. Um, we chose to design something that would meet the needs of our users while staying consistent with our voice as an entertainment company that values design. So after the brand went through a comprehensive redesign and with our newfound knowledge on what makes an app findable, we decided to launch with our new Netflix N on a black background. Again, if Netflix members cannot find the app, they can't get into our content on a mobile device. With the growing importance of mobile, especially globally, we couldn't let our app get lost in the mix. The second Netflix project I'd like to talk to you about today is called Continue Watching. If you're a Netflix member, you're most likely, you've most likely seen the Continue Watching row in your homepage, and maybe you even take it for granted like I did. However, it wasn't always there. Those of you who have been using Netflix since it launched in Latin America in 2011 might remember this top row you see here called Recently Watched. This row shows you things you were not only in the middle of watching, but also things you had recently finished. Our design team looked at this row and wondered if those two types of content didn't deserve to live separately in the Netflix environment. Before I move on to the next slide, I'd like to point your attention to the information we're using to convince the viewer to watch Breakfast at Tiffany's, 
We're telling them it has a four star rating, to telling them it's rated NR, that it's an hour and 54 minutes long and giving them a synopsis of the film. We even tell the viewer that we recommend this title to them based on their previous interest in the film charade. So what you see today is actually two separate rows in the Netflix experience. The continue watching row and the watch it again row. One of my favorite parts about this project is that they didn't stop at that one change. However minor it might seem, it's actually an important one. Back to that information I was just talking about. We gather data on what kinds of information a viewer needs when they're in the middle of a title. And you can see here that all of the information that was there before has been really edited. This is because the data showed that when you're in the middle of watching something, you don't need to be sold on the title anymore. It's no longer about discovery. It's about reminding. And sometimes when you're in the middle of a movie or TV show, the synopsis could even give something surprising away now that you know who all the characters are. So we cut it down just to the progress bar, which is a reminder that you are in fact in the middle of watching this, an image still of the film, and how much time you have left before you've finished. Breakfast at Tiffany's is a film, and while these learnings mostly held true for a TV show as well, we still had to adapt for new scenarios where someone was in the middle of a season and maybe had just finished an episode uh, and needed to be sold on the next episode to continue watching that. Um, perhaps they even needed to be re reminded what happened in the episode prior. Every time I see the continue watching row, it reminds me that even the simplest of optimizations can have a really meaningful impact. So I'm running through the hypothesis at the end of these projects because I want to tie it back to that process that I talked about in the first place. And the hypothesis here was that if we focus the first row of movies and TV shows, to be those the user has already started and optimize the information we show them for the right context, viewers will play more content and be more satisfied with their subscription. The last Netflix project I want to share with you today is No Lefties. And again, this is another example of a small design change having a meaningful impact on the way our viewers find content. So what was... oh. So back in 2014, the design team noticed that our users weren't following a reliable browse pattern on the TV experience. When people got to a row that interested them, they scrolled both left and right equally. As many of you have learned in design school, users have a reading pattern that either maps to an F or a Z. However, our users were not following these standards at all. So we hypothesized that this, this had to do with the opacity of the movie artwork on the left-hand side of the focus ring. After we lowered that opacity, users began to uh, get to the content they wanted much faster and began following a reliable browsing pattern that we could then optimize even further. Every single one of these design problems was initiated by a designer at Netflix or the design team together and welcomed because at Netflix we really do believe that a good idea can come from anywhere. So what was the winning hypothesis for this test? We guessed that if we could guide Netflix members down the path we had designed for them, they would find something to watch much, much faster, leading them to be more satisfied with the service and not get stuck in that dreaded paradox of choice. Before I wrap up, I want to quickly mention three of my favorite tools for chasing problems. Prototyping can surely be done with paper and pen or post-it notes, but there are some amazing technological tools out there that can that vary on level of difficulty, but help get your idea across to more and more people. Framer is a prototyping tool that's incredible, and some people are put off by it because of code, but they've made some really amazing recent improvements that make it much more friendly for people to use if, even if you're not into code. Flinto is surprisingly simple. I know some designers at Netflix who are like, I don't know about this prototyping tool, but it's actually been incredible and super useful. You can jump right in, it's really not difficult. Marvel is the same deal as Flinto, I think, and they even have web experiences. Uh, Marvel has a TV app as well on the Apple TV, so you could prototype TV experiences, which has been super helpful for the team at Netflix. 
And last, I want to leave you with an idea that it was introduced to me only a week ago. The first thing I want, to do, want you to do is imagine your mind as a mountain covered in newly fallen snow. Now imagine each thought and action you take as a path in the snow. The paths you choose to take every day get stronger and it's easier for your brain to follow the well-worn paths. But if you start today and say, I'm going to forge a new path where I keep my eyes open for problems I can solve, your brain will adapt to that path and it will become second nature. So get out there and chase your problems. The moment I chased mine, it completely changed the course of my design career. The personal problems you solve for friends and family or your community are the best projects to show in a portfolio because your passion for them will shine through. It's what we look for in designers we bring onto our team. Drive and passion to see ideas through and solve real problems with design thinking. Richard Ting said in his talk yesterday about making stuff that matters, that we as designers live in the best time to be creative, and he couldn't be more right. The internet has offered us a level of connectedness and opened doors to so many new perspectives and ways of working, so go make something wonderful with all of this new potential. Thank you. doesn't matter either way as long as you get your ideas on the paper. Alex. Yes. Excusas. Bueno, acaban de sentir un pequeño sismo. Nada para preocuparse. Así que... ¡Viva Chile!